is on holy ground. And so let's have a word of prayer as we begin today's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that it's the Sabbath and we can sit here together as brothers and sisters in Christ to study your word. Send us your spirit, we pray, to teach us, to convict us, and to empower us for change. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, we're looking at verse 8. The message is entitled, On Holy Ground. And so we're going to take a look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, as our starting verse. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, we see the throne room in heaven. And verse 8 tells us about these four beasts that are around the throne of God. And Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 reads, And the four beasts, each of them with six wings about them, they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. What distinctive attribute of God do these beasts focus on? His holiness. That's right. His holiness. Very, and let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 15. Verse 4. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. Okay. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. If you're there, say amen. Which reads, Who shall fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So, based on this text, who alone is holy? God alone. And so very clearly, these texts illustrate the character of God as being holy. But do you know what it means to be holy? I mean, what would a holy person look like? Maybe they would have a halo over their head. Whenever they're walking around, you see a glow of an aura around them. Or when they enter a room, you hear angels singing. Is that what you, your concept of holiness is? Someone says amen. <laughs> okay. What does it mean to be holy? That's what we're going to explore today. You know, many people know t what the word holy means in this day and age by how it's misused, that word. Um, attaching that word holy to a swear word or a casual common word or profaning the Lord's name in vain. Right? Just watch the movies and you'll see that they always do this, right? They always misuse the Lord's name um, every chance that they can. Um, also, because of this word association, Satan has also succeeded in diluting the significant meaning of the word Holy. So, what does holy mean according to the Bible? Well, in studying the Bible, there's a rule of interpretation that is called the rule of first mention. And what this rule says is that if you want to understand what a word means in the Bible, the true meaning of that word, you have to go back to the first mention of that word. And most likely, that first mention of that word actually tells you what that word means. And so, the next obvious question is this. Where do you think in the Bible do you see the word holy come up first? Okay. All right, turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. 
Exodus chapter 3. This is the first mention of holy in the whole Bible. The first mention of holy starts in Exodus chapter 3. And this is the story of Moses. Okay? Exodus chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. So where was God in this encounter that Moses had? He was in the burning bush. That's right. The, bu the bush that was burning with fire, but it was not consumed. Yes? So, what does God tell Moses to do? Take his shoes off. Why? He was on holy ground. You know, it's very interesting because you remember something similar like this happened to Joshua. Remember? When Joshua was about to storm the city of Jericho, he met that angel... Right? And that angel of the Lord that looked like a soldier, but he was the captain of the host of the Lord. And when, when Joshua says, are you for us or, or against us? Right? And Joshua 5.13, the same thing happened. This angel said, take off your shoes. For the ground you're standing on is holy. So, the same thing takes place in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. So, for those of you that are not Asian, like me, Okay, if you, if you wondered why we Asians ask you to take off our sh your shoes when you come into our house, to, we do, it's very simple. We just base it on this text. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No. No. <laughs> no, that's not the reason. No, no, no. Um, what made the ground that Moses stood on holy? God's presence. That's right. So, it's almost as if God's presence makes things around him holy, yeah? Would you agree? Okay, good. So my question then is this. Do we have anywhere else in the Bible where God's presence makes things around him holy? Where else in the Bible? Where his presence makes things around him holy? Sanctuary, that's right. Yes, the sanctuary, exactly, exactly. The sanctuary. Where was God, where was God's presence in the sanctuary? In the most holy place, remember? In the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and above the mercy seat was the Shekinah glory, which was the very presence of God, right? The very presence of God was there. And it's very interesting, if you think about it, if you picture it in your mind, like... Um, God's presence right there in the most holy place. And if we picture it like, you know, like how radiation comes out, right? Like em emanating from the center being the most holy place, we'll see that it emanates from boom, the holy place, boom, to the outer court, boom, to the camp around the sanctuary, right? So we could see that God's holiness expands like emanating, like radiation from the sanctuary, okay? Now, I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. I hope you guys are not afraid to study the Bible this morning. You're not afraid of your Bibles, are you? Okay, let's turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Deuteronomy verse 7, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Let's take a look at this text here. It says, this is what God intended for the people, the children of Israel, to be. 
And it says, for thou art a what? Holy people, not just regular people, not just ordinary people, but holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a what? Special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So it's very clear, my friends, that God, as he was dwelling among the children of Israel, he also, because of his holiness and his holy presence being there, he also expected his people that were around him to be holy. Isn't that interesting? He expected the children of Israel to also live a life of holiness, to be his special people above all other people in the world. There's another instance in the Bible where God's presence could make things holy. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, let's turn there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So where was God's presence when he created man? You know, it's very interesting. Before you answer that, when God was creating in the seven days, everything he created, he spoke, right? Let there be light. Let there be the firmament. Let there be the earth, right? But when it came to the day six, when he was creating Man, he did not do that. In fact, he got down on the ground. He formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into him, and he became a living being, right? Now, this is very interesting. He's, it's, it's like God took the time to bend down on the ground to form man. That tells me something. If it's true that God's presence makes things around him holy. If it's true that God's presence, even in the presence of Moses and Joshua, made the very ground holy, and God formed man out of the dust of the ground, that tells me, my friends, that God intended Adam, God intended all of us to be holy. Amen? This was God's intention for man from the very beginning, to be a holy being. And so we see that even Ellen White says, when he created Adam and Eve, Ellen White even refers to them as a holy pair. They're both together to reflect the image of God until sin came into the picture. So based on today's scripture reading, 1 Peter 1, 14-16, God calls us to be holy. Now, why is God calling us to be holy? Why does this matter? Well, let's look at some examples. Can you think of some things on earth today, in the 21st century, right now, that are holy here on this earth? Is there anything holy on this earth? Okay. Are you sure? What does that say? Holy Bible. Okay, okay I'm helping you out here. What else? Whatever, what other things here on this earth is holy? Or, okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Christians. Okay. Okay. You're getting ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> you're getting ahead of me. All right. Okay. But, but things on earth that are holy. We know that the Bible clearly mentions these things as holy here on this earth. Despite the fact that we live in a sinful world, there are things on this world that God considers holy. And they are the Bible. Okay. The Sabbath. Right. Isn't that why we're here today? Right. And we should keep the Sabbath holy. Amen. It's not like any other day. Marriage. Okay. Marriage is meant to be holy church. And we'll talk about that a little later. God's church is meant to be holy. And his law. Right? 
These are a few of the many things that God considers holy here on this earth in this 21st century. Okay? Now, it's very interesting. If you look at this list here, all these things are what God considers holy. And, you know, when God says that these things are holy, these things are to demonstrate what God is like. It is to reveal the ho that holiness is possible. And because of that, my friends, I believe that Satan attacks every one of these things. Every one of these things are under attack. Do we not see the Bible being attacked? Do we not see the Sabbath being attacked? Do we not see marriage being attacked? Absolutely, because all these things are what? They're holy. God, they're to portray what God's plan was for man to the world. And these things are being attacked. And so we see that whatever God calls holy bears heaven's signature, that God has done a good work in you or in that thing. And so has God done a good work in you? That's the question. You know, interesting in Revelation chapter 14, we see the 144,000, they have the Father's name written upon their foreheads, which show that they are very distinctly different from the world around them. Lord desires, this is found in um, be, To Be Like Jesus, page 282, the Lord desires His church to show forth to the world the beauty of holiness. It is to demonstrate the power of Christian religion Heaven is to be reflected in the character of the Christian. So why is it important to be holy? For such a time as this, God is calling us to be holy so that the world will know that there is something different. Something peculiar, something out of the ordinary, something that is set apart, something that is better than what this world has to offer. And it's through his holy people, his living ambassadors, that proclaim the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages are powerful messages. And what makes those messages powerful are not just the messages themselves, but also the messengers that give those messages. Did you hear what I said? Why? Because I used to be in a business background before I became where I'm at now. And I used to be in the business world. And it's very true that when you're in business and you're selling something, you better back up your product and better, better put your foot where, where your, your mouth is, right? So you better be able to endorse your product and say, and testify firsthand, yeah, this product I can stand by because it's worked for me, right? And so we see in the same way, the three angels' messages are proclaimed with power because the messengers themselves can testify that they have experienced the power of God in their lives. And I'd like to submit to you today, my friends, that the three angels' messages are a clarion call to holiness. A clarion call to holiness. And we're going to go ahead and look at that right now and see how that is. The first angel's message says what? Fear God and give what? Glory to Him. Now, how do we give glory to God? How do we give glory to God? Well, if we look at the Bible and what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 tells us, whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now that tells me, if it's talking about whatsoever we eat, drink, and do, that's talking about our life. Our life. And it says, worship Him as Creator. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. You guys know that verse. Good. New creation. So in other words, it's, it's, we give glory to God by what we eat, what we drink, what we do, holy living. And also, it is 
through Christ, through God, that we can be recreated into a new creation. You know, one of my favorite reformers is John Wesley. He started the Methodist Church. And when he was a student at Oxford, he started what was called Holy Clubs. Did you guys know that? Holy Clubs. And these clubs did not arrogantly claim that anyone was holy in the group. No, 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 no. These holy clubs were just accountability groups that met, and they were really desiring to live a life according to the Bible. They're really desiring to live a holy life. And they would be accountable to each other. And here's one set of nearly two dozen questions similar to what John Wesley gave to members of his discipleship groups more than 200 years ago. I want you guys to listen to these questions because this is really, really interesting. Um, all right. You guys may not read it out, but that's, you cannot read it probably up there, but I'll read it to you. But listen to these questions. This is what they'd ask each other. Am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I am better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Do I confidently pass on to others what has been said to me in confidence? Can I be trusted? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? Did the Bible live in me today? Do I give the Bible time to speak to me every day? Am I enjoying prayer? When did I last speak to someone else about my faith? Do I pray about the money I spend? Do I go to bed on time and get up on time? Ooh, Guilty on that one. Do I disobey God in anything? Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? How do I spend my spare time? Am I proud? Do I thank God that I'm not as other people, especially the Pharisees who despise the publican? Is there anyone whom I fear, disown, dislike, criticize, hold a resentment toward, or disregard? If so, what am I doing about it? Do I grumble or complain constantly? And the last one, is Christ real to me? Wow. These questions really take you through a process of self-examination, doesn't it? It's hard to face the sobering truth about yourself. But when was the last time your small group meeting talked about stuff like this? We don't do this anymore, right? Oh, we strike a nerve, it's too touchy. Oh, it's like, you're getting in my business. No, don't do that. But this is what they did. This is what they did. Every time that they met, they were faced with these questions every day to see where they were in their Christian walk. My friends, I think we can learn something from this. I think we need to put this post, this post it up in our room. And, and take a look at ourselves, a hard look at ourselves. You know, the second angel's message says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because they made all nations, that includes the whole world, by the way, all nations, right? Drunk with wine. Now, wine, the Bible represents false doctrines. And Babylon means confusion, right? Therefore, the whole world is in a spiritual state of drunkenness and confusion. Confused about what? You know, the Bible tells us as Christians, although we are in the world, we should not be of the world, right? And so in a world where immorality is constantly on the rise, in a world filled with gray where there seems to be no absolutes, the, right, the lines of right and wrong are blurred, in a world where entertainment, movies, music, television shapes our minds, our values, encouraging young men and women to lose their virginity, to sat gratify selfish ambitions, lust is to be pursued and violence is to be praised, fashion is to be idolized, pride is to be worn like a badge of honor, time and money spent on amusement. 
a world that says that there's no purpose for your life because you were brought about by chance. So live for pleasure. You only live once. So live it up. A world that says that the law of God is no longer binding. It doesn't matter what day you keep. It doesn't matter what you do. We're all under grace now. So you don't have to keep the literal Sabbath. That's been done away with. Nailed to the cross. These and many more counterfeit teachings like these go contrary to the word of God and are characterized as the wine of Babylon. False teachings. For this reason, for this reason, it is our responsibility to warn them, to call them out of Babylon. Because Revelation 18.4 tells us, come out of her, my people. My people. We still have some of God's people in Babylon that we have to call them out of. People that are entrenched in Babylon. They don't even know it. That ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. Now, if we were to look up that word, the definition for the word holy, we would find in the Bible, the Bible's definition of holy means this. It means apartness, sacredness, and separateness. Now, I don't focus on separateness. Separate from what? Separate from what? The world. That's right. Separate from the world. You know, <laughs> when my wife and I first came to Andrews, we really wanted to visit an Amish community. We really wanted to visit an Amish community. Because you know what? The Amish, they are so different. They're so peculiar. And, and, and we, we would like... And we recently got the chance with the Carols. They're not here today, Laura and Nathan. We, we went to Shipshawana, and we saw, like, it was like a huge tourist spot. You know, tourists from all over the world or the area come, local people from everywhere, to pay to see how these people dress, how they eat, how they live, all that. Why? Why would people pay to see these people or to be where they're at or to see how they live? Why? Because they're different. That's right. Because they're distinctly different from the world. And you know what, my friends, that's interesting. God is looking for a final generation that will represent him in these last days. Through God's people, the world will take notice of us because we're distinctly different from the world. He wants you and me to bring others to the knowledge of him. And, you know, we're so worried about how people see us, how they perceive us. We want to blend in. We want to be accepted by everyone. So we say, oh, let's not stand out so much. Let's just try to, like, go with the flow. But that's not the life of a Christian. That's not the life of a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, might I add. I want to tell you this, my friends. For those of you that are worried about how people see us, do not be ashamed that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Embrace it. That's what God called us to be at this time. There's nothing to be ashamed of. God gave us the counsel of how we can be his people in these last days to represent him fully. And we are ashamed of that? Let me share an example with you, another example. My wife, she was in Korea. She's visited twice now in Korea. Every time, now and then she's, I kind of stole her away from Korea, so she needs to go back home every now and then. But um, she was in a shoe store one time in Korea, and they asked, while she was trying shoes on, they asked her, oh, we noticed you don't paint your toenails. Why? And if you, and, if, and in Korea, if you guys know Korean culture, everyone paints their toenails. And Korea is like this culture where it's very conforming culture. Everyone does everything that everyone else is doing. And if you don't do it, something's wrong with you. Right? And so they say, oh, you don't paint your toenails. Why don't you paint your toenails? And you know my, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm not condemning those who do paint their toenails. I'm, I'm just using this as an example. Okay? But, but there's a principle that we can learn from this. Listen, because instead of cringing about it, how we have to explain why we don't do certain things. Could it be that God is presenting those as opportunities 
for you to share with them. Why? Giving them a reason. The Bible tells us, be ready to give an answer for the faith that you have. Now, when I was in college, I went to a secular college, and sometimes people would invite me to these parties where there was alcohol. And I wouldn't drink the alcohol. I would just be there, but I wouldn't drink, but I was just there to support the friends that were you know, having some sort of celebration. And they'd say, hey, man, why don't you drink? You want something? Like, no, thank you. And it's like, why aren't you drinking? You know, like in, and like, oh, you know, I, don't, I just don't drink. Oh, what a wasted opportunity. You know, I could have just shared with them why, right? Not to condemn them, right? But to give them insight that there is something better out there. There is something better out there. And, you know, God presents these opportunities for you, friends. Every time you interact with non-Christians, they ask you something, that is an opportunity right there to explain to them why you're different. Why you don't do the things that they do. Why you're peculiar. They're asking because they want answers. Why are you vegetarian? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Right? Why don't you smoke or drink? Why don't you live with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Why don't you go partying Friday night? Why don't you work on Saturdays? Why do you dress differently from others? Why don't you cuss and swear? They ask you these questions. Now, my question is to this to you. If they're not asking you those questions, if they're not asking you those questions, could it be that they don't see you any different from the world? Friends, are we followers of Christ? Are we followers of Christ? Okay, let's be confident when we respond, okay? Because I'm kind of getting worried here. I feel like I'm preaching to, to people that are not responding to me, okay? We are followers of Christ, right? Amen. And what does Christ say? If you want to be my disciples, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Okay, I hope I'm making sense here because some of you guys are looking at me like, like I'm teaching something strange. This is what the Bible says. Blame the Bible. Okay? I'm upholding what the Bible says. Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus is not an easy thing. Amen. There's a cost involved. There's a sacrifice involved. There's self-denial involved. And the world tells us the opposite. And when we try to go with the world, go along with what the world says, that we are no different. We are not his disciples. We're not worthy to be called his disciples. And so my friends, my friends, in this day and age, in this day and age, we need to be distinct. Not to judge people, not to say I'm better than you. Because there are some Christians that do that. There are some Christians that say, hey, I am a Pharisee. They don't say that, but they have that attitude, like, hey, I'm better than you, unlike you publicans. Right? That's wrong, too. Right? We must bear heaven's signature. The signature of heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is what God is saying. Come out from among them. Don't touch the unclean thing. I will receive you. Just come to me. The third angel's message, my friends. Oh, this is a tough one. I, like some people cringe about this message because it's so harsh. But the third angel's message talks about the beast. Right? The mark of the beast. Those that worship the beast and his image and receive the mark of the beast and those who have the seal. Let's actually turn there. Well, before we do, um, those who receive the mark of the beast, those who have the seal of God, are the two distinct groups. Okay? Now, those who are sealed are approved for holy characters. What did I say? Those who are sealed are approved for what? Holy characters. Okay, and how do we know this? Revelation chapter 22 verse 11 tells us, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Interesting. 
So there comes a point, there's, there's going to come a time where when this declaration is made, these people are sealed based on the state of their condition that they're in. So those who are holy will remain holy. Now it's interesting. The wicked, it says in the third angel's message, uh, Revelation chapter 14. Turn there with me. Revelation chapter 14. Now, Revelation, the three angels' messages are not there to scare you. It's there to warn you. Okay? And so, to be warned of this is an act of mercy that God is giving us in these three angels' messages. The third angels' message, Revelation chapter 14, um, verse 10, right? It talks about the wicked that are tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of who? presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Okay, now, I want you to get this. The presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. God's people. God's people. Not the wicked. God's people. When they're in the presence of God, they will have attained holy characters that when they're in the presence of God, they will not be consumed. But the wicked, in the presence of God, cannot stand it. They will perish. The presence of God. It's all about the presence of God. Is the presence of God real in your life? Are you allowing Jesus into your life? Is that presence changing the way you live your life? Um, in the devotional, Ye Shall Receive Power, page 131 tells us, Christ dwells in him or her who receives him by faith. Through, though trials may come upon the soul, yet the Lord's presence will be with us. The burning bush in which was the Lord's presence, did not consume away. The fire did not extinguish a fiber of the branches. Thus will it be with the feeble human agent who puts his trust in Christ. My friends, that burning bush is an object lesson for us. Either we have the presence of God in us so that we will not be consumed, or either the presence of God will consume us. One or the other. And you know what? How many of you here love Jesus? How many of you guys love to be in his presence? I certainly hope that that will be the case throughout the time till Jesus comes. Because my friends, we know that there are a lot of things that are competing for our time. For the presence, to take presence in our hearts in place of Jesus. You know, the presence of God is the key to holiness. I'm almost done, but I want to share this, this example. When did Jesus lose his temper? You guys remember? When did Jesus lose his temper? Oh, Jesus lost his temper? Not loving Jesus. In the temple? What did he do in the temple? What was he doing in the temple? He was casting the money changers out. He took a cord of, and made whips with it. <laughs> and he was like driving the animals and the people out to overturning tables. Wow, that's not the picture of Jesus that I know. Now, did Jesus just lose his cool and like that's like we just kind of wink that, okay, he's Jesus, so we'll just, just let that pass. Is that, well, why did he get angry? Okay, they were, def they were desecrating the temple, weren't they? Doesn't the Bible say that we are the temple of God? And if Jesus had that much zeal to cast out those things that desecrate the temple, would he not have the same zeal to cleanse our temples, our soul temples as well? 
That's what God wants from us, my friends. In this day and age, God wants us to truly represent him. But we still harbor things in our heart, the little sins in our heart, the little sins that we love, the little sins that we hold on to. And God wants, Jesus wants to come into our hearts. I believe Ellen White says that Jesus' very presence banishes sin because sin cannot stand in his presence. The question is, do we have Jesus in our hearts? Are we allowing him to cleanse our soul temple from everything that can defile? Now, my wife, <laughs> before I share about my wife, I love my wife, but let me, let me pause here. Are there things in this world that we cherish that are competing or that is leading away from holiness? Are we so engrossed with the things of this world that we've lost sight of spiritual things? We need Jesus to come into our hearts. Back to the story of my wife. Um, oftentimes when we go out, my wife would um, ask me, how do I look? And I'd look at her. I'd say, oh, you look good. Um, except that. Maybe you should change that. Or um, maybe you should wear something else. And you know what she does? She does it. Why? Right. I mean, guys, we're very visual, right? And I know guys are very visual. So when there's something that, when my wife is wearing something, I'm like, oh, no, don't wear that. Because I know what it's going to do to other people. And I don't want anyone to... I don't want anyone to see my wife in that way but me. Right? And you know what? It's very interesting. She does it because she knows I love her. I'm not trying to control her. No, he can't do it. I'm not trying to mi micromanage. No, I'm doing it because I love her. I cherish her. I don't want to share her with anyone else. She's my wife. She belongs to me. And so she listens to what I say. That's very interesting. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul brings out the same picture. Ephesians chapter 5, Christ is described as the husband of his bride. So turn there with me. This is a beautiful picture. I want to just close with this. Because some of you guys may answer, why do we have to live a life of holiness? Why? That's so burdensome. Oh, well, pastor, you're putting a yoke on us, right? But I want you to look at this with me. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And what does Christ do to his church, his bride? It says, verse 26, that he might what? Sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And look at verse 27. Why? That he might present it to himself as a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Don't you see, my friends? The reason why Jesus is calling us to holiness is because he loves us and he wants us to be his perfect bride. And is Jesus going to succeed in that? Is Jesus going to succeed in making a glorious church? Amen. We see in Revelation chapter 21, John says, I saw the holy city coming down, New Jerusalem, as a bride adorned for her husband. Do you want to be his bride? Are we working towards that? Or are we going backwards in our Christian walk? That's something to think about. Something to think about. God loves you immensely, friends, and he's doing everything he can to sanctify us, but are we cooperating? Are we cooperating because we love him? That's got to be the motivating factor. Do you love Christ? That you're willing to change your life to follow his will? Or are you going to continue exercising your own will? 
over his will. I can't wait for that day, my friends. I can't wait for that day. Because you know what's going to happen when we get to heaven? And we have lived that holy life by his grace, by his grace, by cooperating with his power that's available to us. When we get to heaven, he's going to give us a crown. Ellen White says this. He's going to give us a crown. And you know what that crown's going to say? Holiness to the Lord. That gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Holiness to the Lord. That's saying, in other words, God's saying, you have been holy to me during your whole time on earth. I gladly claim you as my own. My friends, it's a beautiful ending to this great controversy. I want to ask you, where in your life have you not yielded to Christ? Where in your life have you not completely allowed him to have his way in your life? Because the reason why he wants his way in your life is not to deprive you of something good. It's to give you something better. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that loves us. Should we not respond in that same way? If that is your desire, I want to... If you want to say, Lord, there's something in my heart. I know I'm not there yet, but I do want to continue going forward, not backward. If you want to make that decision, can I see a show of hands? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, the God who loves us so much that he does everything and above and beyond to allow our salvation to be secure. Lord, you see these hands. You saw those people that the Holy Spirit has spoken to, it's spoken to me too as well, Lord. There are things in our lives, there's areas in our lives that we are not completely surrendered to you. And we have failed to represent you in this world. Lord, help us to have courage. Help us to have that love for you. To stand for you, though the heavens fall. Because we know that you love us so much, we can only respond in the same way. So Lord, please have your way with us in our lives. Help us to learn how to relinquish our will. Come into our hearts. Cleanse us from our soul defilement. And allow your presence to remain forever. This is our plea. In Jesus' name, amen.